Hi, Patrick. So there's so many reasons to be pessimistic at the moment, whether it's war, famine, aging population, climate change, obesity. But there's one thing that really does seem to give cause for optimism, and that's science and technology. Uh, and I'm really interested to know what you think the potential of that is for the public services and whether Whitehall gets that. Is Whitehall embracing the kind of transformative power of technology in the way it should? Well, I, I might start by saying that um, I, I challenge actually this audience to think, because I've not found anyone who can give me the answer to this question, of a single area of government policy or operations where science, technology and innovation isn't going to make a difference. So the starting point is, you know, you take um, how we think about our transport system, uh, how we think about our housing, how we think about design of towns, how we think about, of course, our healthcare delivery, the brilliant examples of education, think about the Ministry of Defence. I mean, every single department could be dramatically changed and need science, technology, engineering, innovation to do so. If you then say, well, what about things like national resilience? Well, defence and security for sure. But in my time as, as government chief scientific advisor, um, I was called in for um, Novichok poisoning in Salisbury for, and you may remember this, drones over Gatwick just before Christmas, for collapse of a dam in, in, in uh, the Tobruk Dam, uh, a little bit on COVID, of course, which took up a, a large chunk of my life in that. But therefore, it's important for every single part of policy, every single department. It's important for resilience and security. And you look across the world, as has been shown this morning, seven out of the ten biggest companies are science and tech companies. They grow faster than other companies. And you look at the relationship between um, the amount spent in a country, both private and public, on R&D and productivity, and there is a positive linear relationship. So the economy is completely dependent on this. So the question is... Surely a government has to be completely on top of this in order to manage all the things a government needs to manage. So for me, for me, this is central to successful government. And that begs the question you led to, which is, is it any good at it? And what do you think? Well, you know, I've just been amazed studying the NHS with the Times Health Commission. 12% of hospitals are entirely paper-based. Yeah. There are lots of departments within hospitals can't communicate with one another. You can't use cut and paste if you're a consultant, it's completely mad. So how prepared is Whitehall for this? Well, I think right the way across nearly all liberal Western democracies, we're not very good at it. And uh, it's no, And I'll give you some examples as to, as to why we're, we're not good at it. When I first took up my job as government chief scientific advisor, I asked the question, what percentage of the fast stream, so the graduate intake scheme, where the future leaders of the civil service are going to come from. What proportion had a STEM degree? 10%. Now, I don't know what the right answer is. It's not 90%, but it can't possibly be 10%. So you, you, the whole system is geared towards people who don't have science, technology, engineering expertise. The curse of PPE. Well, may, somebody, somebody many years ago said to me, why isn't there a degree called PPS? Uh, um, which, which took me by surprise. I thought, actually, that's quite a good idea. Um, but I think there is something about getting people in. Of course, you need all of the different skills. You need the arts, humanities as well, absolutely. But we, are, we have not got enough people in the civil service, and we certainly haven't got enough people in the political system who've got a science, technology, or engineering background, and that holds us back. And what about AI? Do you think that's a benefit or a threat? Oh, I think, I think it, it's a benefit. And uh, um, no question, there are all sorts of areas where it's going to be absolutely transformational. We've just seen it in education. No question in my mind in healthcare, whether you think about the way you um, design medicines, it's going to change that. It already has in terms of the work that DeepMind has done on protein folding. It's going to change the way we operate healthcare systems, diagnosis. Uh, uh, it's, it's going to be dramatic. And what's interesting about that is, it's not, it's, that's not a threat. That is a massive improvement. And the one thing that I think we should hold on to as to what difference will that make to all of us is it could actually give you more time to have human contact between a patient and a healthcare practitioner. 
the thing that's stretched beyond all belief now. So we should think of AI not as a replacement, but as something that's going to change the way we do things to allow that human interaction. So do we need to be less worried about privacy and data and just be more open to it in the way we are in, with shopping? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think just to, to, to come back to AI first, I think there are, you know, there are things we need to worry about. So um, do we need to worry? And, and there's a sort of timeline around those. So here and now, we should be concerned about truth, um, about deep fakes, about what is verifiable and what's not. That's a reality that's being looked at. There are ways to deal with that, but it's a here and now. Then there's a, um, a rapidly approaching area of jobs which are going to um, change out of all recognition. This is the Industrial Revolution all over again, where jobs changed out of recognition. That is not something that you just sit back and watch. It's something governments actually need to plan for. You know, how are we going to make sure that we create the jobs, we retrain people, we train uh, people coming up through schools in the right way. And then there's a sort of unknown, both in terms of timeline and where it ends up, of what I'm going to call autonomous harm. You know, what happens when an AI system actually gets the ability to do things which are, which are very damaging? And we don't know where that goes, and clearly we've got to be on top of that. So, so that's the, 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 the sort of three areas I think we really need to, to think about. Uh, and in terms of data, yeah, we, our data is incredibly important for the AI, for feeding AI, and for all sorts of other areas as well. And fragmented data systems, inappropriate fragmented ownership, in, the inability to have interoperability hampers almost everything. And we need to, and government holds a lot of that data, we need to be much, much more open about use of data, much more willing to allow it to be interoperable. And that needs, needs a bit of systems engineering as well, but it's also about our attitude to it. And you're quite right. I mean, most people are very open with their data in everything they do online and very worried about it in areas like healthcare. And we've got to get past that, otherwise we're going to hold ourselves back. And what sort of regulations do you think need to be put in place to protect us from the threats from AI? Or do you think we need to embrace it and sort of celebrate the innovation? Well, we definitely need to celebrate the right. innovation and make sure it's it, it, it's able. What we do need, though, is a regulatory system that can keep pace with the pace of technology. Yeah. And that is not something we've got at the moment. So uh, a regulatory system needs to be imaginative and exploratory. So the use of so-called sandboxes to do that. But they need, they're going to need to be multi-regulator sandboxes. So if you look at um, many startup companies or companies dealing in, in high tech, some of them will describe they have to go to 13 or 14 different regulators. That's going to kill you. Yeah. So we've got to make that simpler and we've got to get the right skill sets in. Just as I said in the civil service, the regulators can't actually get the right skill set in, and certainly not at the pace that's needed. So we need to free up their ability to uh, employ people. We need to not be so uh, strict about the sort of pay grades in the regulatory system, give them a bit more freedom to do things differently, be able to pull people in from industry to help with that as well, and to reduce the fragmentation across regulators with um, sandboxes and other approaches. And what about China? Do you think they should be invited to the AI summit that the Prime Minister is planning? Well, I think, and, and I, I, I'm going to speak now very much as a scientist, it's never sensible to exclude the people who are doing great stuff in, in areas, and they are doing very important work in AI. Now, you might not like the use they're putting it to, and there are all sorts of legitimate questions about how, how one responds to that, but it doesn't seem sensible to me to exclude them from it, um, and they ought to be part of the narrative, part of the debate, and there ought to be scientist-to-scientist -scientist discussion around this as well. And in terms of international collaboration, what do you think should happen now on the Horizon programme? We should, we should join it yesterday. And um. at any cost, I mean, what, what's the delay and how much frustration is that causing to you? You've uh, seen it presumably from the inside yeah, and from the outside. It, 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 it. It caused me frustration inside and, and it caused me pain and frustration outside. I think it's, it, it's absolutely clear. A system like Horizon, which allowed great collaboration right the way across Europe, is now of geopolitical importance. China's in the ascendancy in science and technology 
Uh, America's obviously doing great stuff and also has become a little bit more protectionist on it. And we've suddenly cut ourselves off from this uh, um, system. It's damaging to the EU and it's damaging to the UK. Uh, it's there with long established routes. It takes years to get those sorts of systems set up. So trying to replicate that domestically isn't sensible. Although I do think there's an opportunity for us to be much more global. So it's not just Horizon, there's other global things as well. And it's there ready for us to join. And I think um, you know, once the Northern Ireland protocol issues were, 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 were not a block any longer, as Ursula van der Leyen said that day, they want us to join, we should join. Mm, okay. And I, I went to Israel a couple of weeks ago and I visited the Sheba Medical Center. And they have two billion pounds worth of tech startups. Should we be more proactive about um, you know, deals between public and private sector in science and technology? How, what does the government need to do to sort of liberate that amazing resource of NHS and the science and universities community? Well, so we need knowledge inside government of this because it's important. There, it is specialist, and, and I might you know, come on to Vaccines Task Force and what we did there in this. It needs a procurement system that actually creates pull. So government can be really good at creating pull for innovation, but that needs a totally different approach to procurement from the one that's normally handled. And, and, and I'll, I'll say this because I, I think this is important. It also needs an acceptance of failure. And one of the great problems is if you innovate, you are likely to fail. That is not something that's well catered for in a government system. You know, the National Audit Office has rightly hailed the Vaccines Task Force as a great example of how you can get things to work. I can totally guarantee that had they not got a vaccine, which by the way was quite likely that you didn't end up with a COVID vaccine, that would have been hailed as the biggest waste of public money ever. Yeah. And that is what stops the ability to take risks. So we have to have a system that allows risk taking and allows a portfolio approach to risk. Uh, as we and think should about doctors be able to make a profit themselves from their discoveries? Well, I think um, in most situations in the university sector, uh, there's an inventor uh, uh, sh shareholding or, 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 or return which comes along with that. Um, and that actually is a normal part of practice. I, I don't see why you wouldn't have that system where you get some return for something that you've invented or created. In fact, I think in the UK, if you don't actually... Uh, give something back to the inventor, you actually fall foul of IP. So um, I think there is a, you have to do it. We're nearly out of time, but I just want to ask, what excites you most and what frightens you most? I mean, it feels like we're really on the cusp of a new age or we're already in this new age. What do you think are the most exciting things that we're going to find over the next 10 years and what are the most terrifying? Well, we are absolutely in the middle of an age of accelerated innovation that's going to change all sorts of things. And we're in a really good position in the UK to do something about it. You know, we've got great science in the universities. We've got great startups now. We've got a problem with scale-ups, which relates to all sorts of things, including pension funds and other areas. But we need to do that scale-up. And, you know, we've got the chance to get technologies for net zero. And by the way, that's a growth story, not a cost. You know, we should look at what the technologies are, the companies are, and the UK should aim to have those companies here. So that's a growth story. And you look around areas like synthetic biology, which was mentioned by somebody earlier on. It's extraordinary, the things that you can now make using engineered microorganisms. You can make new materials, you can make uh, sensing processes. You know, these are huge changes that are going to improve, improve life. And what am I most scared of? It's that we'll sit by and watch it. Mm. It's going to happen somewhere else. Mm. It should happen here. Patrick Ballas, thank you very much. Thank you.